Perfect. Hi, everyone. I, my name is Buki Abdul, and I'm one of the career coaches at the Center for Career Development and Academic Exploration. And today we have a very interesting conversation that we'll be having today. And it is about alternative careers in arts and humanities. And generally, the idea for the program or for this conversation is because we know that there are several other opportunities that are available to students that you may be aware of or not. And the idea that your passion is very important. That's, yeah, I celebrate passion. I celebrate what you're interested in. But then also uh, being open to new opportunities that might come along the line and that can help you end up somewhere else. And that somewhere else is still success, right? It doesn't mean it's not successful. So yes, yeah, so that is what kind of like what our framework will be like today. And uh, what we'll do is I will introduce our panelists and then I will spotlight them so we have our panelists together. And then um, we would ask questions. So I have some questions that I've prepared, but then we'll open it up for you all, for students as well to ask questions. So if you want to unmute yourself to ask your question, or if you want to put it, put it in the chat, you can go as well, go ahead to do that as we move along. But I will introduce our panelists and I have some questions prepared and then we'll do that. Does that sound good? Are we good? All right, cool. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to read a bit of their bio as I introduce them, and then I will let you all know who that is. Okay, so the first person on my list is Courtney Jo Sandage. Courtney Jo serves as the Associate Vice Provost and leads the first year experience team of the Division of Student Success. She works closely with first year programs, new student orientation, and the newly created UT Success Academy. And Leaving a learning community. It is shared in collaboration with UT Housing. She's responsible for ensuring incoming first year and transfer student scholars have a successful first year experience. Courtney Jo has a Bachelor's of Arts in theater with an emphasis in performance and an MS in personal financial planning from the University of Missouri, Columbia. So that will uh, lead me to welcome Courtney Jo Sandage. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Yes, all right. Cool. And then, so the next person I have on my list is Ricky. Ricky is a graduate of the University of Tennessee and with a Bachelor's of Arts in Studio Art and Pratt Institute with an MS in, in Information and Library Science. She currently works as a user experience researcher in New York, having primarily gained her professional experience in the world of FinTech. She now works as, at Discovery as a UX manager, global product and UX research. Please join me and welcome Ricky. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here, thank you. All right, then I have Wes. Wes graduated in 2016 from UT's honors program with a dual major in history and Hispanic studies. After graduating, he worked in marketing and sales support for wholesale distributor HT Hackney for four years. He then transitioned into a sales and operations role at the Knoxville-based third-party logistics company, Axel Logistics, in early 2020, where he has since been promoted to the logistics consultant team lead. Join me and welcome, Wes. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me and very honored to, uh, to share with the other panelists. Very impressive careers you guys have. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. All right. Last but certainly not the least, we have Daphne. Daphne joined Discovery um, in 2008 as a contract image specialist. Prior to Discovery, um, Daphne was a contract graphic designer and junior programmer analyst at Fastec. As a graphic designer, Daphne created technical drawings and recreated a variety of company logos for advertisement. Uh, Daphne is a graduate of Maryville College where Daphne majored in visual communications. Knoxville is Daphne's home, as she says. And Daphne attends photography meetups with other photography enthusiasts. And she's a 
practitioner of various self-defense art forms. I'm particularly interested in that. So join me and welcome Daphne. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. Yes. All right. So this is all of our panelists. We have four people today. And like I said, I will start out with some questions and then we'll keep it open for you all to ask questions as you may have them. Does that sound good? Thank you. All right. So I know that I just introduced you all and read your bio, but that's coming from me, just reading your bio. We would like to hear from you and tell us what is your background like and how did you get to your current professional role, right? So like, how did you, what's your story? What's your professional story? And I will start with Wes. Sure. Well, uh, I guess to start uh, with history and Spanish, uh, or Hispanic studies major, I've always loved words, uh, how they impose meaning, how they're interpreted, how communication can be done effectively. Um, I studied rhetoric and particularly uh, when I did my history and Hispanic studies theses. Um, but when it came time to graduating, I was like, all right, next step is grad school. And I'm just not that excited about it. Um, so I've always loved being in front of people and talking and teaching and saw myself in a teaching role. but uh, just didn't really see grad school as something that excited me um, to commit my life to for the next couple of years. It just doesn't seem like the right path. So then I kind of have a crisis my senior year and I'm like, all right, what am I going to do then if I'm not going to teach, you know, how am I going to you know, use my skills? Uh, and I never really thought about going into the business world, uh, but had some people consult me on, uh, you know, marketing, being really using words to sell products, to explain services. Um, so that's really what I started targeting was marketing and sales support type roles. Uh, always had kind of a bad taste in my mouth for what sales is or business. You know, uh, I liked learning something I was passionate about, wasn't passionate about numbers, right? That's why I didn't go to business school. But, uh, you know, I really found in interviewing that a lot of employers are looking for soft skills and coachability. And that's what a lot of uh, arts and sciences background students can offer. And I think a lot of us just didn't really think about those skills being valuable to a business in a marketing or a sales role or advertising. So the role I started out in at HG Hackney was kind of more copywriting, uh, which is you know, helping write out services or products and explain those well to our customers. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. So I kind of dabbled in a little bit of design work as well at that time. But what I really thrived in was the customer facing side meeting with clients, explaining the value added services that HG Hackney, my current employer at the time, offered and what made us different than our competition. And I found so many of you know, my research and writing skills from studying history to be directly applicable to that. And so it was a really natural fit. I loved it. I was super shocked to love it as much as I did. And in that, you know, I saw that I was really better at the sales side than I was at like the advertising and design. So when it came to same time to take my next career step. Axel Logistics was offering more of a sales role. Um, so really liked the company, liked how it rewarded uh, you know, hard workers and people who are creative. And the company gives you a lot of flexibility to kind of do sales and run your little book of business, you know, however you like, which I appreciated autonomy as well. Um, and I've found a lot of success at the company doing just that. So uh, I don't think if I would have studied business or management or whatever, I would have come to the success that I've had in a business management type role now. Thank you so much, Wes. Like you've kind of hit on the points I want students to be getting already. Like your arts and sciences degree, the value of those degrees, the soft skills you're gaining. I'm very excited for this conversation if you cannot tell already. <laughs> but um, so the next, thank you so much, Wes. The next person I will go to Ricky. Sure. So um, as, as you mentioned, I have a Bachelor of Arts from UT um, in studio art, and now I do research for a media company. So quite, quite, quite the jump there. Um, when I was in probably my junior year, um, I was kind of like getting a little bit burnt out with art. I love art. I still do it to this day. Um, but I was kind of like, I think I need to like tack something onto this degree because the officer was, wasn't really sure like what I was going to do after school. Like I didn't think that far ahead. I was like, I like art. I'm going to do it now. And then that's like 2014 rookies problem. And then 
it was 2014, so I need to do something about it. Um, so um, UT has a lot of really great minors that you can tack on to your degree. And I was like, okay, I like computers. I like HTML, you know, CSS coding. Like, let's see what I can do to kind of tack that on. It's kind of related to art because you're doing design a little bit. So let's go from there. Um, so my first stop was a computer science mi minor, and that was a mistake. Um, computer science is really hard for me. I don't know how to code. So <laughs> I was like, okay, plan B. And I found that we have a really great information sciences program, information science and technology. And um, that minor fit me a bit better. It wasn't HTML and CSS. It was about how to do the proper layout of a website. So it's usable, um, looks well, um, you know, all those things. All the things when you go to a good a website and you're like, wow, this is a great experience you learn it in that minor. And that's where I found out about what user experience even was as a practice. So research, re user experience research and design. And I call that my light bulb moment where I kind of thought, oh, this is kind of what I wanna pursue. I could see myself doing this for a long time. And you know, the rest was history, um, focused on that. Once I graduated from UT, went to grad school for it. And I've been in New York ever since. Um, one thing I probably will want to highlight is that you don't have to go to grad school to do this. You don't have to have a formal degree. One of the great things about UX is that no one has a direct, you know, A to B path. People from all different backgrounds are able to do this practice. Um, if you like to be collaborative, if you like talking to people, if you like flexing that creative muscle and solving complex problems, you can do this job. Right. I like that. Thank you, Ricky. I like that we're getting information about your industry generally and even how you got there. So this I'm going to be sending this recording to my UX design students as well. Good. But yeah, <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, then we'll go to Daphne. I'm sorry. I had to keep you on mute. My lawn, lawn guy is out there mowing at the moment and it's really noisy. Uh, my path is, uh, <laughs> well, I can say I love school because I've done a lot of it to get to where I am. Um, again, I have a, um, uh, what, is, what is my degree in? It's in visual communications from Maribel College. And my emphasis was on graphic design and um, fine arts. We did a lot of um, murals and things of that nature. Um, I've also been through a web development program. I worked at a um, computer training institute and they decided to put me through their web program. So that's where the web background comes from. And once, I've got, once I got to discovery, um, I was dealing, in, dealing with photography and I decided I wanted to be the best at what it, what it is that I was doing. So I went through the program at UT and it was a three-year program. So I ended up graduating from there and I, that was one of the best things that I've ever done as well. So um, all of those things, graphic design, um, web development, photography, all that type of stuff ties into what I do um, on a daily basis, which is basically I deal with photography from end to end, um, whether it's primarily working for Food Network and HG, uh, I am under, under <laughs> the Discovery uh, Plus, um, streaming service, but most of the stuff I do is uh, uh, photography based and I deal with a lot of editors and digital ad sales to make sure our photography looks as good as possible on the website. Thank you, thank you, we're excited to hear more about that. And then I'll go to Courtney Jo. Sure, thank you so much, Luki. Um, so me, my story, um, so um, theater was what I always wanted to do. Uh, I loved acting and performing growing up. And, and so I, I did that all through like just being a kid, all middle school was doing it. And then my high school I went to was a performing arts high school where I had to audition to get into my high school and I majored in theater there. And I mean, it was my dream to become a professional actress. Um, after high school, I did move to New York and I attended the American Musical and Dramatic Academy and I was majoring in musical theater. Um, and I only, unfortunately, I only did that for one semester because I was just like, mm, I don't know if this program, I felt like my high school experience was a little bit better at the time. And I'm like, 
the program, I wasn't going to receive a degree. And so I had to really think about, okay, do I really want a degree? And, and also it was really expensive. And I did have a lot of scholarships that got me through that first semester. But after that, I knew I was going to have to borrow a significant amount of loans. And so I was weighing my options. Do I borrow loans and, and not get a degree? Or if I'm going to borrow, I probably need to get a degree. So I ended up at the University of Missouri Columbia. I transferred in. And because of my experience at New York in New York, I got 30 credit hours in one semester. That school was a huge is a conservatory. I mean, you were you were in class from 7:30 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. And so the blessing was I only did a semester, but I was able to start as a sophomore at Mizzou. So it took me took me three and a half years to get my bachelor's degree. Um, once I got to Mizzou, I continued to major in theater. And um, but how I got into higher ed was that I needed to work in order to continue to supplement my college experience. I had to work to, to pay bills and things. And so I chose the financial aid office because I was just interested in like finances, I guess. But also they had an eight to five schedule and that allowed me to be able to still do theater in the evenings and the weekends. So that was the type of job I needed. And because of my schedule, I was able to work like 25 hours in the financial aid out office. And so because of that, I'm working as a student worker in the financial aid office. I'm working like 25 hours. They're like, you were really good at this, the stuff that I was doing. And I was like, okay, but I'm gonna be an actress. So, you know, I'm just doing this, um, doing this to, to pay my bills and I'll, I'm gonna be on Broadway. That's what I was always saying. Um, um, I did get to do off-Broadway with Mizzou. Mizzou had a program called Mizzou on Broadway. And it was a complete, uh, the production was student, all students, the students wrote the production, directed the production, and we were able to take that show to New York and perform on two stages there. So it was a great experience. But after graduating, I like applied for all these different MFA programs. I auditioned everywhere for a master's program in theater and like none of the doors were opening. And I couldn't understand y'all because I'm like, I'm good. I'm um, and but none of the doors were opening and I wasn't I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. I did not want to go back home. So I'm like, what am I going to do? And so here's the financial aid office. They like, listen, we like you. <laughs> so if you want to stay here, we would really like that. And I'm like, well, I don't have any other option right now and I still need to pay my bills. So I end up taking a full time position in the financial aid office. And y'all, it has now been 19 years that I have been in higher ed. <laughs> so um, I cannot believe that. But, um, but it's been good. And my theater experience has been wonderful for me, even in higher ed. There's a lot of public speaking that I have to do in my job. And as a trained actress, I'm ready for it all the time. And also, um, I, I, I love the creative part of my brain to be able to, I'm always trying to figure out how do I infuse theater into what I'm doing right now? And so right now I'm working on a project, like I'm very connected with the theater department here at UT, uh, working on a, collaborate, a collaborative project with them right now for civil discourse for first year students. So we're gonna use actors to, to do some stuff with first year students. So so um, theater is still very alive and a part of my life. It's just different, um, but I'm really grateful for my journey. So that's a little bit. Uh, hope I didn't take too much time, Bookie. Sorry. <laughs> that's fine, Tiffany. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. I like the. So I mean, I love being an actress as well. So <laughs> I connect to that. We should connect later. Anyway. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, yes, ma I got you. <laughs> Yes. So I think your your last um, statement is just going to lead us to the next question I have. And at this point, um, for people that are listening, start thinking of your questions because we'll soon open that up for you all. Um, so it's what would you say is the value of your degree, like your arts and sciences degree? Because I know you alluded to the fact that you are still using theater even now. And, and I think that's one thing that a lot of students don't don't think about they're like okay if, if it's not 
studio art. If I'm not acting, I cannot do anything else. But how can I still use the skill? Or oh, what is the value of acting, not acting, of your degree? Now I'm not going to stop saying acting. I apologize, you all. But um, what is the value of your degree? And how do you see that playing out even in your current role? Um, so I will let Courtney just start since you kind of like started with that. And then anyone that wants to jump in, feel free to jump in with that. Sure. Um, wow, it's a great question. I think the, I mean, the value of it is incredible. So first of all, a theater degree is wonderful. Um, the classes that you take, you never, you wouldn't think about, I, I would have never thought about how they translate into my role. So one of the courses that I took was called character analyzation where it's just understanding a character's motivation. Why is this character doing what they're doing? Why did that play right, you know, make that decision? Um, what I love about, what I love about my, what I learned from that class is that it helped me. I've been um, in leadership for about 10 years now out of my 19 year career, and I've managed a lot of people. And I feel like that character analyzation class like really prepared me to like be insightful. You know, um, sometimes when you're managing people, they don't always tell you everything that's going on, but it, you know, you can gain just some insight, you know, just based like what's motivating them. It also allows me to be empathetic um, and really uh, understand. I know that there's always something that's connected to something that's connected to something, right? When it comes to us as uh, sweet human beings. And so I feel like it has really helped me as a leader in management. Um, I've also had to do some really big projects when it comes to transformational change and getting people to change when they don't want to change. And I feel like my theater degree and just some of the things that I learned uh, has really helped me to uh, navigate some of those difficult, uh, difficult things. And I don't know, I, but overall, I feel like theater just makes me more like I don't know, soft-hearted, like just more open. And um, I think that's what I love the most about theater. And that's, so I hope I'm, I think I, that was answering your question, Mookie. But yeah, those are just some ways that it's been translated. Yeah, anyone, think, thank you. Anyone can jump in and answer. Um, I, can, I can jump in because I kind of have a, I have an arts degree, like an art, art, arts degree as well. Um, and one thing I will say is probably the versatility of a degree like that. Um, you know, you don't have to go into the specific field of your degree where I feel like sometimes degrees like engineering and business, it sort of like forces you to go on a certain path with an arts and sciences degree. You can really, you know, do anything you want. You learn these amazing soft skills. Um, you learn things in your in your classes you don't think about you're like oh yeah of course I just like do this kind of thing all the time and then when you're in the real world you realize how it can be applicable I'm thinking about for like you know when you're in art I remember a lot of my classes we were giving prompts about how to interpret you know certain prompts and create art, art based off that prompt I do that all the time now in my current job um, I'm given basically prompts from stakeholders and I have to think about research plans based off those prompts um, similar to Courtney Joe's point I think also these degrees give you a sense of empathy somehow I don't know it's always intentional but I think you do develop a bit of empathy with the classes you have to take even thinking about prereq classes and etc and you know that helps you relate to people my job is a lot of like speaking with people um, day to day, either one on one or in groups, and kind of having to sometimes be a mediator type of situation. And I think having a degree like that kind of helped build those foundations. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, in, with an arts and science degree, we're all storytellers, right? I mean, that's what we're taught. We write papers, we perform, we communicate. You know, those skills are useful everywhere unless you're like an engineer you know and then some engineers even have you know great skills at that but uh you know i bounced it off of uh ricky's point like some degrees are very specialized my wife's a clinical social worker i couldn't do what she did just because i wanted but there's a lot of flexibility in the workplace especially in the business world for people who are good storytellers who are good communicators and who work hard you know uh I hire, I do a lot of interviews now uh, with a lot of college graduates. And if I see a college graduate that has a 4.0 in business, and I see a arts and sciences graduate that has a 2.8 in, you know, 
history or English or whatever, and they interview better, I'm hiring that person. You know, I don't care what their background is. I'm hiring a person, you know, for a specific role. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for somebody that can communicate, that can sell themselves, that I can trust talking to a customer. Uh, and that's going to work hard. Um, and, you know, you don't have to have that much qualifications for a lot of the entry level business roles that you, you might be looking at. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of them out there uh, that a lot more than what you'd think. Um, so we're chameleons, you know, be a chameleon, you know, find something, find something that interests you soft skill wise, and then uh, try to talk to some people like us about what types of roles there are out there. There's a lot more than you think. Oh. Uh, I kind of forgot what the question was. I'm listening to you guys talk. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, I would just say, what's the value of your arts and sciences degree? Like what, what you started, what's the value of that major? Where do you see that translating to right now? Well, well I think it translates, it, it coincides with what I, what I do um, quite well in terms of the gra graphic design portion. Um, I still use the rule of thirds whenever I'm uh, editing photos, which when I first started out, my, my immediate supervisor just couldn't believe it. I mean, because nobody else was doing that, but that's what I did with graphic design. So that's how I would crop my photos or edit my photos and co using color theory in terms of editing, because I do a lot of color correction if, if a, a photo or a still image comes across my desk and the color is not off or in the studio, there's like a red tint or whatever. I have to be able to get that red tint out of there so it looks good on the website. So a lot of the things that I use in graphic design and in art, um, because I'm such an aesthetic person, I, I like to see everything so it look aesthetically pleasing. That has translated into what I do every day. And everything I do is not, really art related, a lot of it's technical. I mean, because I do a lot of work in the dam, but the art part of it definitely ties into what I do. Thank you. So um, at this point, I still have more questions that I just prepared just in case, but I'll open up to, to you all that are uh, listening right now. What questions do you have for our panelists? If you want to unmute yourself, or if you want to put it in the chat, whatever works for you. All right, so I see Ben already has hand up. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Um, so my question is very specific to uh, a career idea that I have. Um, so I'm a sociology major, which is like a lot more science, at like actual science based than a lot of other arts and science degrees. But I am, I am also a singer and I have a, I'm doing a minor in history. But uh, what I specifically want to apply that to is something like national public radio. Um, and I guess specifically doing stories that like involve sociological research, like being a correspondent for foreign things that are occurring that like involve a lot of the things that I am studying. So my question is mostly like, what is this specific path that someone like it's it's not a very broad question it's very specific to what i'm going through but like how do i pursue such a specific path with a social science that isn't necessarily uh you know communication designed that something that like npr would need from me uh, it doesn't uh wuot operates out of uh out of UT's campus, uh, I'm pretty sure it, it might be good to reach out to some of them and uh, uh, I bet they'd let you shadow or meet some people and kind of pick their brains. They'd probably be the best people to talk to about that. I think yeah. sometimes, you, okay. Okay, I definitely. was gonna say, sometimes you just have to get your foot in the door. Uh, initially when I started this, this job, I started out as a contract worker, but the request was for someone to do content migration. I had no earthly idea what content migration was. And I was like, well, you know what? I'll go in here, I'll do my best. And if they don't like me, they'll fire me. Well, <laughs> turns out that I was the best at what I did. I really, really enjoyed what I did. And I just became the best at what I did. So sometimes you just have to get your foot in the door. Um, and it may not be exactly what you're looking for, but you can transition to something different. 
Yeah, that's really good advice. And um, I would just say also find people that are doing, you know, what you want to be doing and ask if they're free for informational interview. I mean, you know, luckily we live in an age where everyone's just a Zoom call away. So, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people on LinkedIn, email people, tweet at pe- direct message people on Twitter, you know, all of that. And, you know, just kind of get yourself out there that way. Um, that's a great way to make connections. Something I did when I was first starting out and um, it really helped me a lot to make those connections when I was done looking for a job later, so. I I would add to all the great things that have already been said, but um, just, you know, an opportunity like internship. So if you know any, any stations or if you know anywhere here in town or where you're from, I would just see if you could intern with them um, because that's a great way to, to get your foot in the door. Um, Thank you all for that. And then um, luckily I work with students interested in communications. So I work with a lot of like radio stations and um, students interested in broadcasting and all of that. So I would, one thing I would also suggest as a follow up to this is if you have some time schedule an appointment with me and like we can go more in depth into how and what the like direct um, um, path might be. But generally it is experience matters a lot. Right. And from what you've heard from people here, experience and skills that you're bringing to the table, soft skills is something that cannot be taught. Right. And but employers look out for those things as well in different positions. So work on gaining those skills and most importantly, work on building your portfolio. What is very interesting with radio work is you can start to do things on your own without actually working in the radio station because you can like start a podcast. You can start working on different things and such that once you begin to talk to people, like Ricky said, you have something to show them. And you're like, hey, I have this experience I'm bringing from this field and I know it will be very applicable to you all. So it is start gaining experience and that can look differently. That can look like you volunteering. That can look like job shadowing. That can look, I mean, I I feel like I'm already saying what all that I was saying in an appointment. So I'll leave that and then just um, have you, if you're half time, schedule an appointment and then we can talk about that. But thanks for asking. Cool. Any other question? I was going to say also you could do like professional organizations um, in terms of you could volunteer that that would be another way for you to get experiences volunteer for professional organizations whereas I don't do graphic design now but I've, I've done it for um, worked as a design director for like WICT which is women in telecommunications and I've also uh, done work for other professional organizations so that's a good way to put something on your resume. Thank you guys so much. Hello, everybody. Um, I have a question, but then I was going to drop a. I don't know. Have I been muted the whole time? It's been a long day, everybody. I think I may have. Was I muted the whole time? Okay, good. It's been a day, people. I was going to put the link in the chat to Ben if you want to volunteer. That's information for volunteering at WUOT. Uh, my name is Allie Brewer, and I'm one of the associate directors in Arts and Sciences Advising. And so, like everything that you all are saying today is just like good vibes and things that we tell students all the time. And so, it's just um, music to my ears hearing hearing you all talk. And uh, and by the way, Courtney Joe, our director in Arts and Sciences Advising, was a theater major. I don't know if you know Missy Parker. Uh, so, uh, but she says that her theater major helps her every day, you know, of, um, of her career. I had a question for you all. Um, you know, I think for so many students the, the that first job, that initial transition after graduation is the hardest. And then, you know, as students get more experience, they just sort of gain momentum and then they do really well, but initially it's really hard. So, you know, would you all give any specific advice or was there anything that you did during your undergraduate years or just after that you felt was really supportive of your transition and any words of wisdom you would impart to students about that transition? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, it, a lot of silence because uh, it's not easy. <laughs> you know, I, I think for me, having a good community of people that were going through the same stuff, having mentors, you know, uh, that I could pick their brains about was really helpful. Uh, I did a I did a program called the Knoxville Fellows out of college, which kind of sets a lot of that up for you. So I was really lucky to have that. Um, wh- one piece of advice I would give is uh, don't be afraid to give something a shot. You know, don't be afraid to give something a shot. Uh, and I would say give it a year. Like it's usually like if you unless you like just really hate something like one thing I've noticed that a lot of people can get stuck in is like kind of paralysis of like, oh, shoot, I don't know what I want to do. And then you work at like four or five different jobs in like two years. And it's that's a little tough. Like give it a shot. The first six months of any new job is going to be really, really tough. And then usually after that, you figure out what you like. And a lot of times, a lot of companies have various different roles that you might not even know about. You know, so give yourself a little bit of time, find something that seems like a decent opportunity and stick with it. Show a little bit of grit, you know, make it at least a year and then make a decision from there. I think that that goes a long way, especially when you're applying for other roles going forward. Wes, I think that's really good, really good advice um, about, you know, like give it a year, you know, give it, give it some time. For me, I mean, again, I didn't expect, you know, to be in the financial aid office. And even though I worked there as a student worker, and so I was familiar with the team and familiar with the environment, those first couple years after after graduating was still really hard because there were times, I'm be honest, I was so bored. I'm like, I am bored. Like, I'm bored, but um, back then, and like, I'm dating myself, but back then, um, you, you didn't just jump around, you know, you kind of, you needed to kind of keep your day job back then. Um, Cause it was also like, I graduated in 2006. And so the financial crisis happened in 2008. And so that was two years after it was like, I need to keep this job. Um, so, but what I will say is because I hung in there, I think after two years, I did start applying to other places and things didn't work out, but I hung in there. Um, And then other opportunities, as Wes was saying, like some companies can have other opportunities for you that you can go to. And I hung in there. Next thing you know, I'm like, you know, I didn't expect this, but like leading a whole wing of the office, um, hanging in there. And then that prepared me for, I ended up going to the University of Nebraska Lincoln and um, was leading a, a area there. And then I ended up developing an entire brand new office at Nebraska. So it's like, and then then I got here to Tennessee and now Associate Vice Provost of tennis, uh, Student Success. Like I never expected this, never imagined this for myself, but hung in there, you know, hung in there. Like sometimes it's, you may be a little bored or different things like that. But one of the things I would say I learned and I would tell myself through, you know, respect the process, respect the process. There's things that, you know, skills that you need to learn and gain. And um, yeah, jumping around all the time. I don't know. I never did that, but I, I can't imagine that being easy either. So um, hanging hanging in there, I would definitely recommend that. Yeah, those are very both very good points, Wes and uh, Courtney Joe. Um, and mine might be a little contradictory, um, so bear with me here. But yes, give things a shot. You know, you know, give it give it the college try, as they say. Um, but if something is not working for you, don't be afraid to try something different. Don't worry that oh no, I'm already doing something different. In my major, I'm already doing something like you know, this whole different thing than I spent the last four years focusing on. If it's not working for you, if you're not vibing, if you're not having fun, you can find something else. You know, you've already proven you're not afraid to try something new, that you're willing to get your hands in there and, you know, do something different. So don't be afraid to pivot um, at any point in your career. <laughs> if you are like, okay, I've been doing this for five years. Now I want to move to something else. You know, find a way to do that. Um, you know, we're in an awesome time where, every piece of information you ever want at your fingertips of how to figure something out and try something, take advantage of that. Um, so don't feel like you have to stay somewhere because it's like, oh, like I've already, you know, made this huge shift. I want to make another huge shift, make the huge shift. Obviously, you know, don't quit your job if you don't, if you can't, but, you know, figure out ways to, um, you know, move away from situations that aren't serving you and don't be afraid to do that. Yes, I agree with her as well. And I think corporate culture is a big, uh, 
a big part of that as well. If you get in a, get in a situation where the culture, the corporate culture is toxic, um, yeah, don't be afraid to hop around. Um, where we work is great. They're very supportive. We have a wonderful co corporate culture. So, um, and we have our, our principles that we go by within our company. And I've been to places where I just hated to go in to work every day. And I forced myself to go there. If you're not happy, it's going to show in your work. So yeah, don't be afraid to move around if, if, if that job does not fit you. Yeah, that's a great point. It might not be the job, but it might be the culture. It might be your manager. Um, you know, I've heard the saying, people leave managers, not jobs. So don't think it's you either. You're like, maybe I'll try this same job at a different place and see if it was just, you know, this environment was not for me. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to like stand up for yourself in that way. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Um, any more questions? I'll mute myself so you can think about a question. I have a question that I would just ask, and that is, um, there were definitely challenges that you all faced, and you've kind of like alluded to that in different ways, but I would like to know, what were those particular challenge in terms of, so, I mean, it could be anything. It could just be that, oh, I know for, especially for a lot of students that are graduating right now, they're like, my friends are doing this. My, I go on LinkedIn and people are posting this and people have a job already. Or, I mean, I just want to be able to tell my classmates, hey, this is what I, where I'm working now. This is what I'm doing. I mean, so this, that's just one of several other challenges that would occur as you're graduating. And I know for some of you here, you already mentioned that when you were about to graduate, you did not know what you wanted to do. And so that was definitely a big one. So how did you navigate? And I think it's very similar to the previous question, but it's like, how did you um, navigate those challenges and were they some challenge that you, you expected to happen or you did not expect all of that? I can go first because I immediately thought of my answer as you were asking or this question. Um, so when I started getting into user research and UX, people really didn't know what it was. Um, it's been around since the 90s, but even in 2014, when I would say to people, oh, I'm going to go to school to be UX research and design, I could see their eyes glaze over with no recognition as to what the words I was saying. Um, you know, I remember my dad being like, that's fake. <laughs> so uh, not only was I getting an arts degree that I was doing this thing, he's like, my goodness, what is this child up to? Um, but I think that's where doing my own research into the industry, into the field, reaching out to people, um, et cetera, things like that really helped me. And also just not being afraid to take the leap of faith. Like, you know, I said, I had my aha moment. I trust in my gut. I trusted that. And I just went for it. You know, I moved to, from Tennessee to New York and luckily it worked out. I mean, if it didn't work out, that would have been okay too. Um, but it did. And so I think just, you know, not being afraid to take the leap and also, you know, just doing your research, you know, there's plenty of information out there. I know I keep saying that, so forgive me for repeating myself, but you know, there's so much information out there and there's people like, you know, like me all over LinkedIn, who would be more than happy to chat with you about you know, this kind of role. So I think just doing that due diligence before I kind of made a big financial leap was, was wise, but also kind of just trusting my gut, even when it was hard and scary was the best thing I could do. I'll go. Um, so I've, I've had a lot of challenges and it's over the years, um, again, just being in the same career field for a, a while. Um, but like one, I think some of my, most of my challenges came once I got into a leadership role and uh, my first leadership position, um, I had 14 direct reports. Um, and that was a lot. And I had never supervised anyone. And I had tried. I was like, can I just at least supervise student work? You know, can I super do the student employees first? You know, and never got an opportunity to even do that. So my first time I'm supervising 14 full-time employees, I think about maybe maybe four or five of them were 
probably 20 years my senior. So they was looking at me with the side eye, you know, like, you know, because <laughs> I was very young and I'm, I'm their boss. So with that, uh, one of the things that was so wonderful for me was I was able to take this leadership program, get into this leadership academy. It was a year long leadership academy, my first year in the job. And I absolutely do not know what I would have done without that leadership program. And so just like training, you know, training and professional development, that leadership program, it helped me tremendously. I literally, I'm looking over at my, my bookshelf and I still have my books and the things that I got from that leadership class back then. And that was it. That was a little bit ago, but I still got those books and that really helped me. And I'll be vulnerable for a moment as well. Um, you all, some of you may be familiar with EAP, employee, uh, employee, a, uh, Think, am I saying it right? So help me. Employee assistance program. Yeah, that's yes. right. Employee assistance program. And because, so had the leadership academy that I did for a year that was fantastic. But then I started having some, some real serious struggles with some of the people that I supervised. And I ended up having to go to EAP, which is where there are uh, professional counselors there. And they're just going to like, they, they can talk to you. They're talking to you about work. And they'll talk to you about other things too, but oh my goodness, I had three sessions with EAP, changed my whole life. Um, and it, so I, I share that to say, like, those are some things that helped me during the really challenging times. And now I'm a huge pro proponent of EAP. I tell people about it all the time, just really helped me as a leader, you know, deal with some of the challenges I was facing with my team at the time. Um, and Honestly, I had, it was one team member I was really, really struggling with. And the counselor I was working with with EAP said, listen, I'm going to have my colleague help that, that employee that you're working with. Because as a supervisor, I had the right to, like, I could require um, an employee to go to EAP depending on certain things. And as a result, so they were tag teaming us and sh that employee had no idea, but that experience helped the both of us. Uh, my last eight months at Mizzou with that employee was the best that I'd ever had with that employee. So I, I share that to say, don't be afraid to utilize resources. So all professional development opportunities, trainings, uh, leadership courses, anything you can take, take those things. But then again, if you need some help, you know, if you need some help when it comes to dealing with the matters of the heart, EAP. <laughs> also, I have had um, in my career an executive coach. So I've had two executive coaches um, in my career where uh, they're just helping me along the way. And so those are the, those are how I've handled the challenges over the years. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump off of that. Uh, I think you're muted, um, Wes. I think that happened. You're right. I have been muted. <laughs> uh, jumping off of what Courtney just said, you know, ongoing education and, and skill development is huge. And, you know, a lot of times in starting a new role, you're not going to love it, but you're going to see some people that have roles that you like. Learn it, you know, uh, do some research. Uh, you know, I, there were some people at my first job that were doing roles that were different than mine that I liked. Uh, so instead of asking to be put in that role, you know, I spent, you know, a few months learning, you know, taking some online courses and then, you know, came up with a proposal, say, hey, you know, here's some work that I've done. Are you OK if I help out with this team? You know, uh, and that you know, I was able to do that, jumped in and eventually led that team. You know, that I, the person's role that I liked, I eventually took over when they left the company, which uh, was an awesome fit for me at the time. Um, and another thing uh, I'll say is, uh, this is kind of a little bit off, to off topic, but don't close doors. Like, uh, you know, when you're leaving a company or, do or doing something, like try to leave on good terms, you know, even if you feel like they've screwed you over or whatever, be respectful, you know, leave the doors open because you never know what's going to happen in the future. My, my first employer is now a client of mine and we kind of left in a contentious way I wanted my role to change. I felt like I should be compensated better. I came up with a, a plan for it. They said, you know, no, we can't do that. You know, uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to have to leave then. I have another opportunity I'm going to take, but I, I like you guys. I'd rather do this, but if that's not going to happen, I'm going to take this other opportunity. 
but I left respectfully and I kept in touch with those people. And uh, a year later, reached back out and uh, they're a client from my current company services. You know, that's an unusual situation for, you know, so try not to make changing organizations be like a true breakup. You know, it's, it's a more kind of moving on. I'll see you later. Um, and then my last thing, uh, find like a nonprofit or something to plug in with. Uh, it's the, uh, I've kind of been able to scratch my Hispanic studies itch by plugging in with a local nonprofit here in Knoxville, Centro Hispano. Uh, they're like an education and activism organization for the Latino community here. And uh, got plugged in with them, helping with copywriting for their website a few years ago, and uh, got invited to sit on the board. And that's been an, an awesome experience. Uh, uh, I no longer sit on the board, but I still uh, stay very active with them and was able to network with an entirely different group of people than who I work with. And it's been an awesome experience. So, you know, going into nonprofits was something that appealed to me in college. Uh, but I found now I'm a much better asset you know, helping with networking and fundraising and, you know, donating my time and my talent and my treasure than I am working at one full time. So there's other ways to get experience with the things that you're passionate about that doesn't necessarily have to be your full time job all the time. It's great if that works out that way. And I'm super passionate about my job, but I love that I can kind of scratch multiple itches by how I spend my time outside of work as well. Um. So I say one of my biggest challenges I'm still dealing with now, and you probably can tell here, mine is uh, speaking up and, um, and speaking here on this panel today as one of my um, things that I'm trying to help me to overcome speaking up and speaking out. I've done things like, um, and I think it, it has kind of helped me back in my career because I'm so apprehensive about speaking up, but I, I have done things in my career to help propel me um, in terms of um, speaking up. I've done like um, speakeasy. I've taken courses at speakeasy, uh, joined Toastmasters. I uh, did a storytelling uh, session that we had here at Discovery. Um, we even had a personal breakthrough leadership um, program that I went through where they gave us an executive co coach and we had to do a, a personality assessment. And apparently my personality is one in which I don't really feel comfortable in speaking up. So I'm always trying to force myself to speak up. Um, but that has probably been my biggest challenge, but I've been working at it for a long, long time, but I just don't know how successful I I am at, maybe I should have been like Courtney Joe and took some acting classes. Maybe that would have helped me, but I'm just, that would be one thing, learn, learn to speak up. I mean, it's very, very important to learn to speak up. I mean, in all aspects of business, um, if you don't feel like you're being paid equitably, you need to learn how to speak up. If you're in meetings, um, and something is you don't agree with it, then you need to learn how to speak up. And these are things that I'm still learning to do as old as I am. I, I just don't feel comfortable, but I, I force myself to do it um, a lot, but you'll get a lot further if you do learn to speak up, I think. Thank you so much, Daphne. Thanks for sharing that with us. And thank you all the panelists and Thank you, Daphne, for speaking up today and um, coming, joining us today. Because I mean, I know when I reached out, I was like, I wasn't sure if people would respond, but you did. And you're here today and students are learning a lot from all that you all are saying. And I'm so grateful for you all. I mean, I have done more questions, but I'll be mindful of time as well. Um, but one, one more question I have if there are no other questions in the, from the audience, but I'll just ask this question. It's one that students shy away from and every opportunity I get to ask professionals that question, I go for it. And about networking, what is there a value to networking? Should students network? I mean, I, are career professionals just being overboard by seeing network every day and things like that? So what is your take and how would you advise students especially with switching, switching between career paths, right? Switching industries. I feel like networking would be a very good help in that particular route. So what is, what is your take on that? And then we'll be out of here in no time. Thank you. 
Networking is so painful. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, I feel like it is a, oh gosh, like it, it is, it is good advice. Networking is good advice, but I'm definitely someone who does better one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I don't know. And I'm, I'm a lot less shy to like reach out to someone like, I don't know, like UX Twitter is pretty active. So like reach out to someone on Twitter, even when I was like young, younger, I'm at, you know, when I was like first starting out and, um, kind of saying, Hey, like love your stuff. You know, I'm just getting to the industry. Would you be free to talk? And nine out of 10, they would say yes. And that was a much better way to make connections for me. So it was one-on-one -on -one interactions as opposed to going to a meetup, you know, having my like little cup of wine and like trying to like awkwardly interact with people. I don't know. Some people are incredible at it and more power to them. I would love to know their secret, but I'm horrible at it. And so that's what I do instead to be transparent. <laughs> And I think um, some, we've kind of mentioned this with other people's responses as well, is that, you know, there's other people at your company that may be doing things or where you're working out, do what you may want to do, reach out to them. It's that nice familiarity. You're at the same company. You can kind of reach out to them that way, as opposed to having to go you know, outside and talk to strangers. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would jump off of that. I'm awful at networking. It's, it's tough. It's awkward. But uh, you just got to find groups that you enjoy being around and kind of plug in and find people that are cooler than you that'll invite you to stuff and that's usually the best way for it to work that's how it's worked for me so <laughs> just tag along and eventually you'll get introduced to people you don't have to be the you know the social butterfly but clear some out there a little bit it's good i need to do it more honestly so yeah, I would uh, agree with that. Um, but also, I think going back to something Wes said about, you know, like companies you worked for, like making sure that you end on a good note. Well, also just making sure you have a pretty good relationship while you're there, <laughs> because um, that makes a huge. So me going to University of Nebraska was because I was recruited to University of Nebraska. Me coming here to University of Tennessee is because I was recruited to University of Tennessee. And so just, you know, making sure that you just even networking within your company, you know, just making sure you have those good relationships within the company or the organization that you're currently working in. That's huge. Um, but yeah, if you're a part of any like professional organizations or anything that's attached to your organization or your company, you know, the best way I love, um, I love to meet people where food is involved. Um, and so, um, give me a plate and I'm happy we can have a good conversation and so just I would just say you know those opportunities you know go sit at other tables that was another thing that one of my uh bosses would tell us back in the day he was like when we go to this conference we are not sitting together everybody go find a place to sit and so I remember initially I was a little nervous and, and that's not really me but I enjoy that like now I cannot wait to just go sit at another table with a table full of people I don't know especially if there's food involved that helps but um but yeah just make sure to get out there you know um if, if that's not as comfortable for you I would just you know you know encourage you to go out of your comfort zone a little bit go sit at a table with some people you don't know introduce yourself and get to know them and give your cards out or airdrop your contact information to them however we're doing it today um do that and it's it's great but so again Make sure you're developing good relationships where you are because they sometimes will connect you to other things and go eat with people. <laughs> I agree with what everyone else has said. Joining professional organizations, volunteering within those professional organizations is a good way to meet with people um, in different areas. Um, going to conferences, meeting people at conferences, taking courses. When you take courses, you meet a lot of people. You, I meet a lot of contacts that way. And I've uh, joined like a, a meetup group here in Knoxville. I've been a member of it many, many years and I've met more professional photographers um, in that organization than I ever did doing anything else. And there's a really, a lot, there are really a lot of great people. I mean, personality wise and great photographers in the Knoxville area. So um, I would just say various groups, conferences and, um, what else did I say? Um, <laughs> and in professional organizations. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, to Iola, we planned this together. I wanted to say, like, I think we chose the best panelists because 
we've gotten like great things and I really love the balance and networking. I love that so much because students are always on different sides of the spectrum. And I'm like, they're like, I don't like it, but then we know that it's valuable. So we talk about it. And like Ricky said, one-on-one, -on -one, it's still networking, right? Talking to like maintaining relationship while you're in school with um, um, classmates, uh, with professors, with academic advisors, all of those things are networking, building and maintaining relationships relationship so i love the mix that we have on the panelists i'm like oh we chose good we chose good um yes like i said i will be mindful of time here um and i'll open it up again is there any other question from the chat or audience okay cool so i would just say final words in terms of what would you say to a student that is currently in the arts and sciences um, department and they want to switch to something else? But it like, what would you say? To, what would be your final words? Because we've already kind of like mentioned all of that, but just like, you know, as people do when they round up um, conversations like this, let's just follow that trend and just say, what are your final words? And Ayola has put something in the chat. Please um, fill a survey for our students and just everyone that I attended not, like, aside from the panelists um just fill out a survey for us to help us know how we can make this better that would be very um helpful so yes final words and yeah thank you all nothing's ever too late you control your destiny so find out what you're passionate about find some careers that seem like they have some of those uh skills or interests and go for it you know you guys are are ready to do it you know you're never stuck wherever you're at yeah i would agree with that 100 percent. that pretty much nails it hits the nail on the head just you know it's never too late and don't it's okay to be scared but you should do it anyway I'd also say just own your path, like own your decisions, like don't make it, you know, if, if, if there's a situation you don't like, change it, you know, you have the power to do that, you know, own it, you got to, you got to take ownership over your future, over your actions, uh, people will see that and, and appreciate it because it's rare, a lot of people don't own, you know, they, they make complaints, they make excuses, you know, create a path and follow it, you know, own it. And I would add to that, uh, add to all what has been said by Ricky and West, um, just being open, you know, definitely being open to, to try new things. And, um, you know, just I think that would probably be my main advice. Again, as you all know, I didn't expect to be here, but um, but it's good. It's been it's been working out for me and I've still been connected to theater all of these years still. So uh, definitely be open. And I'll, I'll say, yes, be open. Also, follow your passion. Do what you want to do and don't try and follow someone else's path. I was told an art degree would not get you any money. You would be poor. You would be broke. Um, I, actually, I knew two people that graduated with art degrees prior to me, and both of them were on welfare. I was like, I don't want to do that. And I changed my major to like business administration. And it was the most boring thing that I had. I, I couldn't stand it. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna have to do what I what I do. I'm I'm an artist. I, I'm I'm passionate about art, and it has been the best thing, that best decision that I ever made because that's what I'm good at. I'm not a business person. I'm a creative person, and it served me well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much. Those words. I'm like, oh, these are really good really really great advice and I mean I think I'm just reflecting on my journey even as a career coach started out as a communications major wanted to work in the radio station and now I'm a career coach but I still get to combine both of the things that I love I get to make my colleagues do TikTok because I love it you know I mean just creating that niche for yourself even where you find yourself right so 
it's just it's just really things that have been mentioned here today and i'm very excited that um, students get to hear this and like i said this is going on our youtube channel so that a lot more students can have access to this because this is good information so i really um want to say thank you all so much for joining us this evening very very thankful for all of the experiences that have been shared and being vulnerable even if right here we 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 appreciate i mean and that's the goal of this conversation for students to see real people that have done this and that so they can see the possibilities and because career coaches can just talk about it and just like these people don't know what they're saying but if i bring people and show you that I know what I'm saying, right? It is real. It makes all of the difference. And I truly appreciate that. And Ricky, I'll be reaching out to you again because I work with UX design students as well. But yeah. thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. And um, if it's okay with you, if you it's okay with you for students to be able to reach out to you, if you don't mind, like just leaving your contact information, like your best way in the chat. And I will save the chat and just share with any student that asks about that if you're fine with students reaching out to you. But besides that, thank you all so much for um, chatting with us this evening. <laughs> I would wait for the things. Cool. All thank right, you yes. So much. This was fun, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for joining Ali, I appreciate it. Oh, you're it. awesome, this has been great.